Okay, thank you so much for coming along, everyone. Uh, my name is Bob Tilford. Uh, I'm a games user researcher at Player Research in the UK. Uh, before that, I was a UX consultant at a uh, web and software UX agency. And before that, I was doing my PhD in psychology. Uh, and today I'm going to be talking about the brief relationships that we establish with our participants during research, the short-lived uh, relationships that we get with our uh, participants. Uh, importantly, I'm not just going to be talking about uh, interview rapport and the relationships we establish during interviews, but more broadly about the type of relationships, the rapport we establish across all our interactions with our participants, uh, regardless of the type of research method or the particular interaction that we're having with our participants. So I'm going to start with some evidence and theory, uh, and then I'm going to derive from that a sort of broad set of principles that we can use to guide our behavior as user research professionals. Uh, and then I'm going to finish by talking through some specific ways that we can apply these principles in our day-to-day -day, day -day work. And uh, like Harvey, I'm using two clickers, so forgive me if I like get out of sync or something. So what do I mean by rapport? It's hard to find a nice, neat definition that does this general word of rapport justice across all its myriad different applications. Uh, but for the purposes of this talk in our field, uh, I'm, I think of it simply as the type of relationship established between research team, that's you, and participants. And importantly, I see this as something that uh, should be considered broadly, as something that, is, uh, that emerges from every little interaction that we have with our participants. Uh, between researchers and participants, uh, between moderators, support staff, anyone who's involved in communication with participants. And my central argument is going to be that we need to be deliberate about our interpersonal manner with our participants in order to manage their impressions of us and the research exercise as a whole. So let's think about this. Why should we care about this? Well, let's consider what we're trying to do as games user researchers. And I wanna focus on two high level goals that we have. And I'm, then I'm gonna go on to talk about how I think we can use rapport to help achieve those goals. So one thing we're trying to do is avoid leaks. We're normally trying to, uh, we're normally testing secret games or secret features, uh, and we need our participants to keep those secrets for us when they leave the lab. We need to trust them to uh, not tell anyone about what they saw during the testing. Another thing, of course, we're trying to do high quality research. Probably everyone at this conference is in some way or another talking about how to do good games user research. We're looking to gain useful, valid, reliable insights into the player experience. And everyone will probably appreciate that the behavior of our participants will impact in a great way our ability to achieve these goals. So let's think about what kinds of behaviors we wanna see from our participants. What kind of behaviors are desirable? Well, when it comes to avoiding leaks, we simply want our participants to feel disinclined to or inhibited from leaking information. And when it comes to high quality research, the first thing I'd argue is that we want our participants to behave in a naturalistic, representative way. We want our results to have ecological validity, not just representing the specific conditions of the lab. Practically, of course, we also need our participants to be somewhat cooperative. They need to be at least slightly on board with this whole thing. Uh, we might need them to, or we will need them to disclose information to us, and we would like their responses to be accurate and well considered. Not only this, but they might need to endure things like game crashes, because it'll likely be an in-development game build, long waits in the waiting area, or frustrating usability issues. So we need them slightly on board, being reasonably cooperative. So I'm gonna argue that by attending to the type of attending to the type of rapport we establish with participants, we can encourage these behaviors and thereby do better research while avoiding or reducing the likelihood that we uh, get people leaking information. So let's have a look at what can get in the way of achieving these behavioral goals from our participants. So what can get in the way of our sort of high level goal of avoiding leaks? I've been looking at news reports of corporate and IP security breaches where someone from a company who has access to secrets goes out and leaks those secrets to another company, a competitor or to the media or something like that. And people will probably be familiar with this, but in these news reports, people are often described as disgruntled. Or in, in other words, they have some kind of ax to grind. And I found a few examples of these. So here we have three instances of reportedly aggrieved staff leaking information 
a former employee of Tesla, someone working for a defence contractor, working with the DEA, and someone working for the UK supermarket chain Morrisons. And in all of these cases, it's like the person who's the perpetrator, the person who's uh, gone, uh, gone ahead and leaked information, has felt somewhat wronged or disrespected. And they've apparently been seeking retribution in some way. At least one of their motivations reportedly is to seek retribution. Uh, or at least they feel more morally justified in leaking information as a result of feeling wronged or disrespected. But there's also a more sort of solid evidence base for this, because that was a little bit anecdotal before. There's a body of medical literature that indicates that doctors' communication behaviours with their patients uh, are associated with their likelihood of receiving malpractice claims against them. So on the left here, we've got a summary of a study where it's shown that patients of doctors with more malpractice claims report feeling ignored, rushed, and receiving inadequate explanations and advice. And consistently on the right here, we've got a summary of another study that shows that Doctors with fewer malpractice claims spend more time setting their patients' expectations. That's things like letting their patients know how their treatment is going to proceed, what their prognosis is likely to be, and what they should expect from it. They spend more time showing interest in patients' thoughts, saying things like, tell me more about that, and what do you think caused those symptoms? And they spend more time displaying humour and laughter. So, consistent with aggrieved staff leaking information, Patients who feel they had poor communication with their doctor, poor rapport with their doctor, might be more likely to sue them. So now let's bring this back to our particular applications here, what we're talking about at this conference. So we need to remember that our participants' natural inclination, the thing they might want to do most, might be to go home and tell their friends about the secret content they played or experienced in the lab. And we need, the, need them to inhibit themselves from doing that. And from looking at disgruntled employees who leak information and patients who are more likely to file lawsuits against doctors with whom they had bad rapport, I suggest that we might be putting ourselves at risk as games user researchers if we fail to establish rapport with our participants and thereby make them feel unwelcome, disrespected and so on. And this might be just enough to tip the scales, making them give in to their motivation, their drive to tell people because that's a thing they're likely to want to do. Or at least, them, at least make them feel more morally justified in doing so. So we've also got this aim of doing high quality research and what sort of things can get in the way of that. So, of course, our research methods aren't perfect. Everyone is probably aware of that. We do things like behavioural observation, surveys, interviews, analytics, all these kinds of things. But none of them are perfect research methods. There's no such thing. <clears throat> um, particularly in... Uh, this is particularly the case for us because we do research with human participants. And of course, everyone probably appreciates as well that humans are complex, messy things. And particularly in psychology, there's an area or a class of biases that's called demand characteristics. A lot of people might be aware of this if you've studied psychology. Um, but these are things that these refer to anything to do with the participants perception of the research that biases them to respond in a certain way. And so I'm sure some people will be aware of at least some of some demand characteristics, I'm going to quickly go through a few just to give you a sense of what kinds of things I'm talking about. And importantly, as a bit of a spoiler, these are all things that I will be arguing uh, that we can mitigate through the type of rapport we have with our participants. So we've got subject and observer expectancy effects. These are things that occur when uh, our expectations of the purpose and outcome of the research affect the results. So, for instance, the participant might infer the purpose of the study or the hypothesis and give responses consistent with that. An example might be the placebo effect. That's one instance. Observer expectancy occurs when we, the researchers, unintentionally bias the results through our behaviour and our communication. Another series of biases might occur when participants are, become acutely aware that they're being observed, potentially leading to increased focus and effort in some cases, or distraction leading to poorer performance in other cases. Of course, either of these would be biases, deviations from their naturalistic, uh, outside of the lab type behavior. And there's social desirability and the acquiescence biases. These are things that uh, so our participants are likely to have an underlying motivation to uh, respond in ways that makes them look good cool, impressive, smart, things like this. An acquiescence bias, uh, Harvey slightly touched upon, describes a tendency to sort of go with the flow. Uh, it's also called yay saying, respond positively to everything, just agree. And then we've got these last two, satisficing and the screw you effect. So 
Under certain circumstances, participants might be only just motivated enough to give the bare minimum of effort in their responding, so that their, their response is only just satisfactory. That's called satisficing. And then there's also this uh, thing called the screw you effect, which uh, is when participants get full on belligerent and actively try to go out of their way to give us unhelpful responses. So there are established procedural ways to reduce these issues, such as double blind or automated experiments. But these might not always be practical or sufficient within a games user research scenario. We don't always have the luxury of doing nice double blind quantitative experiments. So often we're doing qualitative research and it, it just doesn't always make sense to think of it in these ways. So I want to talk about how I think we can mitigate many of these biases by being deliberate about our interpersonal manner with participants. How might rapport help? There's a couple of areas of applied psychology uh, where the nature, of, nature and effects of rapport have been studied. First of all, we've got clinical, psychology, clinical psychological research, where it's been shown that a stronger rapport between a patient and a therapist predicts greater disclosure of information on the part of the therapist. And this has actually been expanded through research beyond the therapeutic settings to show that people in general are more likely to disclose more information to people they like more. So it might be that you can actually get more information from people if you have a good rapport with them. And on top of this, there are some specific therapist behaviours that have been uh, that are predictive of a better relationship between therapist and patient. And these are things of greeting the patient with a smile, asking questions, validating their experience, and appearing honest. There's another simultaneous track of research looking at the effects of rapport in criminal investigative interviews. Here, it's been established that rapport actually leads to more accurate witness testimony. We heard from Harvey about the Loftus and Palmer study in which witness testimony was shown to be biased by the way you asked questions. But here we can see that interviewees who have good rapport with their interviewer are actually more resistant to biases, misinformation, and leading questions. And interestingly, it's been suggested that, the, uh, that these, might, these effects might stem from reduced anxiety on the part of the uh, interviewee as a result of the good rapport they have with their interviewer. It seems, therefore, that there's a general benefit to establishing a good interpersonal relationship for getting people to disclose information while simultaneously avoiding biases. Now, based on this literature I've gone through, I'm going to start trying to summarise some of the ways that we might seek to behave with participants while highlighting on the right side of each screen uh, the demand characteristics that might be mitigated as a result. And so here I'm getting into slightly speculative territory where I'm using a little bit of inductive reasoning here. Uh, about how particular behaviors from us might impact or mitigate demand characteristics. So bear with me. So to begin with, we can try to be forthcoming and transparent with our participants. Try to give them enough easily understandable information about the research. And through this honesty, aim to establish a stronger, more even rapport with them. Next, we can try to be impartial, non-judgmental. We can try to avoid making participants feel like their performance or worth is being evaluated in some way, or that certain responses are more preferable to us than others. We can try to make it clear that any kind of response is okay. We can try to be friendly, warm, and respectful in our tone. In doing so, we can hope to put participants at ease, making it clear that we're on their side. In fact, it's been shown that a more supportive, warm demeanor actually reduces false acquiescence, or agreeing with stuff just for the sake of it. And then finally, we can endeavor to be, uh, come across as interested and focused in the participants. We can make it clear that we value what they have to say and that we validate their experiences. Of course, these four things on the left overlap in some ways. They're not entirely mutually exclusive constructs. They might not have the exact hypothesized effects I've tried to highlight on the preceding slides. However, taken together, the evidence suggests that overall they will improve rapport, reduce bias, and furthermore, if all goes well, reduce the likelihood of uh, leaks of secret information. So we've got these four sort of proto-principles extrapolated from research with doctors and patients, therapists and clients, or therapists and patients, and investigators and witnesses. But I'd like these to be a bit more relatable, meaningful, actionable. So I've come up with a tone guide something a bit more useful for guiding our day-to-day -day communicative behavior with participants. A set of statements that I would hope could be used across the research team, regardless of what your specific role is, as long as you have some sort of contact with participants. 
So here's the tone guide for communicating with research participants. The idea is that your behavior should communicate that I respect you as a social equal. You're doing us a favor and I'm grateful for your time and effort. I care about your comfort, questions and concerns. I'm interested in what you have to say. I won't judge you for anything you say or do here. I am impartial about the product and I'm transparent about the purpose of the research. Now, for the remainder of the talk, I'd like to go through how these high level ideals can be exemplified in our day to day behavior. However, we do, of course, need to acknowledge that we must balance our rapport. If we behave exactly like we do in informal social situations, it could cause problems. If we're too buddy buddy, warm and friendly, not thinking about it that much. Uh, we might lead participants towards socially desirable responding patterns, or we might inadvertently communicate our hypotheses and expectations. Conversely, if we're too detached and socially removed, it could lead people to feel judged, self-conscious, or even lacking motivation to cooperate. Now I'm going to step through the particular things to consider before, during, and after testing. First of all, it's crucial to acknowledge that participants' initial lack of knowledge uh, of what to expect when they arrive and the purpose of the research. Before the participants arrive, they're likely to be quite naive about what kind of research this is, who you are, what your job is, why they're there, what to expect from this whole thing that they're doing. It becomes almost like a problem solving exercise for them where they're in this like information impoverished state and they're seeking any kind of like nuggets of information that they can draw inferences from about why they're there, how long they're gonna be there, what sort of things they should be doing, what kinds of feedback they should be giving, who you are, what you'll think of them, stuff like this. And these are things we need to manage. Our communication with the participants all starts with their initial sign up. This is an important step in the process for setting expectations about what kind of organization you are, what sort of research you're doing, what the participants involvement is going to be. We want to avoid letting them form inaccurate expectations that might bias their responding in some way. For instance, if left unchecked, participants might think that they should act indebted to us in some way because we have brought them to this cool place to do cool research on a cool game or something like that. Or they might assume that we've got an endless supply of testers and therefore we don't actually value them as an individual very highly. Or they might think that they should be in, co uh, in competition with the other participants and that they need to perform well to seem good in comparison to the other people. Or they might think that it's bug testing or QA testing. That's a fairly common misconception. So in our pre-testing communications, we need to set expectations and set a tone that works towards our goals. I'd argue that by default, this tone that we set should be uh, informative, professional, impartial, balanced with warmth, friendliness, and respect. We should be extra careful of making participants feel like they need to present themselves in a certain way to present themselves as a particular type of gamer to get selected. Not only might they lie to get selected in some way, filling out our sign-up form and being a bit uh, flexible with the truth, but they might also, it might also set their expectations for the purpose of the research such that, they, such that they assume they need to behave in a certain way during the testing. For instance, as someone who is good at this type of game, they're therefore needing to present themselves as such even if they're not doing very well at it. Now let's think about what the venue looks like when they first arrive. How does it appear to participants when they walk in for the first time? We need to think about who these people are. Do they like games? Do they know about your company? It might be that your company has a lot of cachet within the gamer community. The studio might have made games that they know and love and talk to their friends about. They might have watched YouTube developer diaries set in this very lobby space that they're now walking through as they arrive. So it's important to note that participants might come in with a sense that your company is this big, impressive, intimidating, unassailable, beyond criticism type establishment. And uh, your lobby space might reinforce this, particularly if it's filled with awards and magazine covers and statues of legendary game characters. And obviously, this is not an ideal situation. We don't want our participants to feel impressed and awed. We want them to feel socially equal with us and able to critique and discuss during the session without fear of disappro disapproval or judgment. And this is a good place to note that throughout the playtest experience, you might need to work to reduce your apparent social status in the eyes of the participant in order to demonstrate that you consider them equal to you and that you have genuine interest in them and their thoughts. 
and if you can, avoid having participants walk through a lobby space like this. Now let's think about how the participant is welcomed. It's probably not surprising to anyone, but evidence shows that people make a lot of snap judgments based on a few seconds of initial uh, communicative interaction with someone. So you should think carefully about uh, what is socially appropriate for greeting someone in your culture or in your particular local culture in order to work towards your goals of rapport. So when I greet people at our UK-based lab in Brighton in uh, England, I try to shake the participant's hand, introduce myself, smile, thank them for coming, offer to get them a glass of water or a cup of tea or something, uh, and use their name when I'm talking to them. And this is all to show warmth and respect and to start putting them at ease. Also think about what you're wearing and what the participants might infer from it. This is particularly a potential problem if you're wearing, say, a t-shirt with your company's logo on it or something like that. Uh, this might imply that you're sort of socially and emotionally tied up with the game and the product and the company, uh, such that the participant should think twice before criticizing any of it too harshly, lest they offend you in some way. It might encourage participants towards socially desirable responding. So at Player Research, when we interact with participants, we try to avoid clothes with very noticeable branding, particularly avoiding things that have anything to do with gaming. Now let's think about how participants are briefed on research procedures. This is crucial, particularly if you're running survey-based research in the lab, where your initial briefing with players might be your most significant actual live interpersonal interaction with them if you're then going to set them going on a game and filling out surveys. Ensure you set out what participants should expect from the session and how you'll be interacting with them. I talked earlier about how doctors who spent more time setting their patients' expectations tended to have better rapport with them and therefore, uh, or that was associated with uh, suffering fewer malpractice claims against them. From our perspective, it should also affect, it should also uh, have an impact on uh, reducing subject expectancy, by, subject expectancy bias. Set a tone of non-judgment, make it clear explicitly and implicitly <coughs> that you're not evaluating them, but rather you're evaluating the product. Let them know that it's totally fine if they don't immediately understand something. Think about how you introduce and frame the status of the product or the game or whatever it is you, that you're testing. It might be that it's very close to completion and realistically not much can be changed, but this is something you might want to downplay for the benefit of the participants and their thinking about it. So you might want to say something like, it's still very early in development and everything is up for change, so feel free to give feedback on any aspect of it. And then make sure to use terminology in your briefing that they'll understand. Avoid internal or esoteric terms like usability or UX or HCI or analytics. Don't make the participants feel uninformed because they don't understand your particular nomenclature. Now think about how you introduce the NDA. You're probably going to have participants sign an NDA right at the beginning of the session. Of course, this has ramifications for security, but also the tone of the rapport that you strike with them. We want our participants to be informed and aware of their legal obligations, but to also feel just inherently disinclined to leak information through good rapport. So ensure you give the participants plenty of time to read and summarise the NDA for them in human terms. Let them know the core details out loud after they've read through it to summarise it for them and help them understand and to also implicitly communicate that you're aware of what the NDA says. Think about how scary you make the NDA sound. You want the participants to understand that it has legal ramifications, but you don't want to risk alienating them through taking a purely authoritarian tone about it. I like to let participants know that we take the NDA very seriously, but follow up by showing empathy and appreciation for them. I say something like, I understand how tempting it can be to tell people about what you see here, but we really appreciate that you don't do that. Now let's think about how the lab is set up. Earlier I talked about participants' awareness of being observed. Your lab setup will of course have a big impact on this. And we want participants to feel aware that they're being observed, but to feel comfortable anyway. So ensure that they feel socially comfortable and confident and that they're not being judged or evaluated, formally or informally. They should feel welcome and safe. Make the environment comfortable and easy to relax in. In fact, it's common that usability labs these days will be sort of designed to approximate a living space for this reason. 
if your methodology permits, consider leaving the room so that the participant can just sort of get on with it in their own time while you observe remotely. If you're in a large lab scenario with lots of players, avoid loitering behind them as they're playing on a PC or something like that, especially when they're filling out surveys and thus vulnerable to becoming particularly self-conscious of what you're seeing them write. Let participants know that the session is being recorded, but don't make cameras and one-way mirrors super obvious and in your face. They don't need to be hidden. They probably shouldn't be hidden for ethical reasons. But they shouldn't be making audible noises and be really obvious and hard to ignore. We want participants to be informed, but find it easy to forget that they're being observed. At Player Research, we actually avoid one-way mirrors altogether for this reason, because we have concerns that participants will behave differently as a result of the strong awareness of the mirror's presence. If you're in the room with participants, think about how you're positioned relative to one another. I've talked about how there might be a tendency to, for participants to feel impressed or slightly intimidated by the environment. So to counteract this, you might need to work to lower your apparent social status. So try to avoid looming over them. Uh, try to be seated on the same level. You might have to adjust the height of your seat accordingly. Don't take up too much physical space as if you're dominating the room. Make eye contact, of course. But don't lock eyes for a weird amount of time, such that it feels <laughs> aggressive and weird. And it can be easy to do if you're sort of concentrating on what question you're going to ask next and you're thinking about seven other things, to forget that you're like staring them in the eyes and you need to break contact. Ensure they've got some physical space there that they can feel as their, uh, feel as their own, at least for the duration of the testing. So if you leave the room and come back in, knock on the door to sort of politely signify that, you're, that you consider it sort of their space for now and that you're just requesting permission to come back in. Now let's think about how you interact verbally. It should be extremely clear through your manner that you're interested in them and their thoughts, but be careful to avoid putting words in their mouths or nodding along only when they give the right or expected answer. To expand on some of the things Harvey talked about, think about the terminology you use in interviews and also surveys. Careful when using phrasings that assume knowledge from the participants that might make them feel inattentive in case they don't know them. Take cues from them and mirror the vocabulary that they use. For instance, avoid using esoteric in-game terminology until you hear them use it already. So if they say something like, I couldn't find that big green thing, then, and if you know the exact name for it, don't just use that name in front of them. Refer to it as the big green thing just for the duration. Make sure you maintain conversation while taking notes. In some cases, you might be taking notes live with the participant in the room, and it, obviously you can't hide that you're taking notes, but try and maintain conversation while you're doing so, which can be really difficult and definitely takes practice. Avoid letting the conversation hang if they ask you a question. Meanwhile, you're frantically trying to scribble down or type out notes on what they said a moment ago. Use humour if appropriate, of course, and smile and laugh if they make a joke, but be careful to remain clearly professional and impartial. And then finally, how do you wrap up and let the participants go? This is especially important. I'm sure many of you, have, many of you are aware of the peak end rule, which is a psychological finding that uh, basically uh, states that uh, when we post hoc evaluate an entire experience, our evaluation is disproportionately biased by the emotional quality of the emotional peak and the emotional quality at the end. So the end is what I'm interested in here. If we're at the end of the session and for some reason we let our rapport go for, as a result of some communication misunderstanding or them thinking that you, misconstruing that you were being passive aggressive or something like that, it might not affect your data because you'll have probably collected all that by now. But you've got to keep in mind that if you let the rapport go bad right at the end, just as the participants walking out the door with a head full of juicy secrets about the game content they just played, based on what I was arguing earlier, it may lead to a higher likelihood of them leaking information when, the, when they leave. So I try to ensure I thank participants, of course, let them know they were really helpful and that I really appreciate their time, shake their hand, say their name to them. This is to show that I've been listening and that I remember them as an individual amongst all the different people I'm meeting. Uh, I encourage them to keep signing up for more play tests and I remind them a final time to not tell anyone about what they saw. So the key takeaways from this talk are this. Use rapport to ensure high quality research and avoid leaks. Think about every interaction your research team has with participants. And I'd also like to one last time present this tone guide again. And while there won't be time for questions like with Harvey's talk, I'm afraid, uh, I'd love to hear afterwards if anyone has any thoughts on this. Uh, this is a sort of work in progress. 
something I've come up with and I'm really interested if anyone has any other thoughts on it, things I've missed, better phrasings for some of these principles. So please come and chat. And finally, I want to thank a great UX research podcast called Mixed Methods. I think it's been mentioned by someone else here today. I think it was my colleague Seb in the first session. Uh, they did a specific interview with a UX veteran called Michael Margolis, and it was super influential for my thinking about this, uh, this talk and the content I put into it. Thank you very much.